Hey, uh, welcome out, welcome back. I'm glad you guys could be here with us. Uh, this is an unusual morning for us. We're continuing in our Ephesians series, but this is a morning um, where, as a mobile church, our truck died. And uh, so I got a call, I don't know, a little bit before 8 this morning, hearing about that. And some other people got calls earlier, a lot of other people got calls later. The truck that usually gets here at 8 o'clock got here at, I don't know, 8, 9.40, 9.45. And a lot of people pulled together and uh, really pulled things off great in terms of worship and everything so far. I think everything pack-wise is going great. So just want to thank those of you, whether you're the people who were drawn out here early or drive here, drive there, figure this out. What about a hitch? What about an alternator? What about alternate equipment? Or, you know, maybe you're on the home front. Maybe you're uh, a wife or a mom who was, um, I don't know, figuring out all the kids' stuff without any help this morning. Thanks for coming together, pulling this stuff off. Really appreciate all your help. Um, awesome to know that you can change an alternator in like 20 minutes if you're motivated. Really cool. Not me personally. Don't call me if you have car trouble. I'm a company. But um, yeah, we got people who can do that, so that's awesome. So we're back in Ephesians, but I want to get started this morning in Genesis. Uh, if you're going along with the Mosaic Bible reading plan, then you've been tracking through Genesis over the last few weeks. I want to jump into Genesis 11, the story of the Tower of Babel. For those of us who aren't quite as familiar, I want to get everybody up to speed. This is after the fall, which is in Genesis 3, where humanity said, you know what, God? We don't want to follow you. We can do better. We deserve better. We don't want to hear you say no to us. We want to do what we want. We can do this God thing better than you. We are going to rebel. Uh, it's after Genesis 6, where God essentially said, you know, I am so tired of seeing how truly wicked you are, how depraved you are, how rebellious you are, I'm going to start over. We've got this one righteous man over here named Noah, and he's got a small family, his sons are starting to get married, I'm going to take now, I'm going to start over with humanity. But by the time you get a little bit further into the story, up to say Genesis 11, you figure out that Noah's descendants, they were also added to the assignments, they weren't any better than the previous ones. What we see in Genesis is that both of these groups were given a command. When we think about Adam and Eve, we think about this, this command about here's a tree, you can eat from other trees, don't eat from this tree. But before they got any information about trees or fruit or anything like that, the first command they were given right when they were created was this. Genesis 1.28 says, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. He said, develop my creation, create and cultivate, be creative like I'm creative, develop the whole thing, and not just in this little garden, develop it everywhere. I want to go global with this thing, I want to give you guys authority to manage my creation, and to be my image bearers, and to spread my image throughout the earth. Alright, and so you get to the end of the flood story, and you get that same command reiterated, that God bless Noah and his son, saying to them, be fruitful, and increase in number, and fill the earth. Alright, so again, humanity is made in the image of God. We're given some of the authority of God to rule, to manage, to develop, to create, to do what He does. And we're supposed to do that, we're supposed to spread out and do that everywhere. He said, I want to fill the earth with my image, and you are my image. So the core message that both Adam and Eve, as well as Noah and his kids were given, was spread out for my glory. Spread out for my glory. Take my glory that I've placed in you and spread it out all over the earth. Alright, but like us, these guys were rebellious. So, they did the exact opposite. Genesis 11. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As men moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we can make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. Exact opposite of what God means. God said, spread out from my glory. And they said, no, we're going to make our names for, make a name for ourselves so that we won't be scattered. Look what happens next. Good. But the Lord came down to the city and the tower that the men were building. The Lord said, if as one people, speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. So these guys could do anything. These guys, give them enough time. If they're working 
together. They can build a rocket. They can go to the moon. They can do anything. Humanity was united as one, and, and that's God's design. That's what he wanted. The problem was, humanity was sinful, humanity was rebellious, and the one thing that they can't, had in common, the one thing that really united them, was that they were all committed to rebelling against God and not doing what he told them to do. So he said, you know what? I'm not going to let you do that. I am going to divide you. I am going to break you up. He said, come, let us go down, and we will confuse their language, so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from all over the earth, and they stopped building the city. That's why it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there the Lord scattered them over the face of the earth. All right, so we're in Ephesians today. Why well, start with Genesis? Because what we see in the story of Genesis in the Tower of Babel is a curse and a problem that we are going to see God undo in the passage that we're looking at today. So at Babel, the people were united together, but at united together, humanity was an absolutely unstoppable force. They could do anything. But what united them was their rebellion against God. So God said, I don't want this. I'm going to break you up. You're not going to be united anymore. And from that day forward, and to some degree from the time of the fall, humanity has been divided. All right, we see that in all sorts of ways. On a national level, we divide over politics. It's red states versus blue states. On a state level, we divide over football. It's maize and blue or it's green and white. On a church level, we divide over a lot of silly things. Like, you know, is, is there going to be an organ and hymns and, you know, that kind of piece of music? Are we going to get a really cool bass player and have him rock out on his guitar with the worship? You know, what are we going to do? What can we fight over? We fight over silly things. We also fight over important things. Like biblical doctrine or the truth of the gospel. But as a, as a matter of course, normal human beings, we can be divided. As a church, we also isolate ourselves from the world. We stand apart from them, we stand against them, and we engage in a culture war. Saying, we know and you don't know. We are right and you are wrong. We have it together, we are good, you don't have it together, you are bad. And we fight and we isolate and we fight. All right, we see it on a family level. Uh, I told you last week when we were talking about being dead in our sins, use the illustration of my grandmother dying. What happens when a grandmother dies is that her estate needs to be divided. All right, so one of the things that I'm praying about and welcoming your prayers about is that my extended family is not divided over the blessing of receiving my grandmother's estate. That we don't become angry and bitter and hateful and proud because we have a different perspective on how things should be divided. Which is a natural course of things to do. And it's, it's work that's already beginning. That we're trying to counteract. Because it is natural for us to stand divided. But God's design for humanity is that we would be completely united. And that we would be united for His glory. Alright? Not united in rebellion against Him. Not united to do whatever we want. But that we would be united on mission with Him. Not in opposition to God, but in submission to God. We've talked about it in the last few weeks, how chapter 1 of Ephesians ends, and how he talks about he designed the church to be the fullness of him who fills everything in every way, to be the fullness of Jesus, that we would be his hands, that we would be his feet, that we would be the fullness of his character, that we would be the fullness of his heart, that we would be mobilized on mission as his body out in the world, united as one man. And then just like at the Tower of Babel, what the world would see is that when we stand united, that we would be an unstoppable force. We'd just be an unstoppable force for God's glory, rather than in rebellion against Him. So in the second half of Ephesians 2, what we're looking at today, we're going to see how God begins to work this out. I want to share one more verse before we get to Ephesians, and that is uh, Philippians 1.27, where Paul talks about how this dynamic should work out in the church. The rest of them, he says, whatever happens, Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel. So again, God's design is that we would contend as one man. Not for our own glory, but for his glory. Not to make a name for ourselves, but to make a name for him. 
How is this possible? How does this work out? How do we see God's desire for this new humanity, this one new man that he would create out of diverse people coming together? How do we see it work out? Ephesians 2, verse 11. Therefore, remember that formerly, you who are Gentiles by birth, who you that's probably all of us, very close to all of us. Therefore, remember that formerly, you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, that done in the body by the hands of men. Remember that at that time, you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, foreigners to the covenant of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. So he says there are insiders and there are outsiders, there are lost and there are found, there are spiritual haves and spiritual have-nots. And Paul starts out by informing his readers, and he could have given the same information to us, you are not in the cool group. At least you were not the cool group. You were not the popular junior higher from a spiritual perspective. All right? You were outsiders. That's what he tells them, and that is what he would tell us. Probably every single one of us, and certainly from a spiritual sense, every single one of us, we were outsiders. And he says, in fact, as Gentiles, meaning non-Jewish people, he said, you were so far on the outside, so far outside the circle, that God's chosen people, the Jewish people, what they would do on Saturday afternoons is they would spend time sitting around in a circle making fun of you because you were so outside. You were so irrelevant. You were so undeserving to even be a part of the conversation. Sounds like a very Christian thing to do right now. But that's the picture that he's painting here. He says if they made fun of you, they called you uncircumcised, uncut, unholy, unsanctified, excluded, separate, not a part of the crowd. Completely outside of the circle. Alright, how did that happen? Back to Genesis. We look at Genesis 12, we see God coming to a man named Abraham. And he says, you know what, I want, I want to set apart a portion of humanity that will be united in following after me. Alright, you just get done with the Tower of Babel. Humanity has been united. They've been united against God. He said, I'm going to start a subset of humanity. They are going to be united for me. And I'm going to grow that subset. It's going to be Abraham. It's going to be his descendants. And I want these people to be holy. Meaning, I want them to be set apart. He says, I'm going to invite them to live differently. I'm going to invite them to think differently. I'm going to invite them to eat and drink and, and marry and raise their kids differently than anyone else in the world. Because the vision for Israel is that they would be a city on a hill. That they would be a light to the world. That they would be the people who would stand on a high hill and they would shout out to the rest of the world, This is our God. And this is what He's like. And we want you to know Him. We want you to see Him in us. We want to bear His image. We want to represent Him to you. That was the theory. They would also be the people through whom the Messiah would come. Through whom Jesus, through whom God would become a man. Through that genetic line, through that chosen group of people. And it worked out to some degree. Jesus did come. But the problem was, just like we would have done for these, for these Jewish believers, these followers of God, at a heart level, they were still pretty deeply messed up. They were still rebellious. They were still proud. They were still more excited about their own agenda than they were excited about God's agenda. So instead of being a light in the world, instead of being a city on a hill, we see that they were a people who got proud. And instead of drawing other people into the circle, they would look at, wow, we are insiders, you are outsiders, you don't belong. All right? There's a certain sense in which that's true, that we don't even belong in the conversation. We talked about it last week, that apart from the gospel, apart from God regenerating our hearts, apart from the Holy Spirit working in us, we are dead. We bring nothing to the table. We contribute nothing to our salvation. We are outsiders. We are outcasts. And we said that we were dead. And by dead, we don't mean bad. We don't mean poor, poorly informed. We don't mean lacking education. We mean dead. All right? We were the ultimate spiritual outsiders without hope and without God in the world. But at the cross, Jesus came and he changed. Verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near through the, through the blood of Christ. Through his perfect life, life, through his substitutionary death, through faith in him, we can be reconciled to God. 
anyone who will humble himself before God can be adopted to the Son. He says, we who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. Meaning, if you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ, you are no longer an outsider. You used to be an outsider, but if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, then you are the ultimate spiritual insider. And one of the implications that's coming out of, out of this text, one of the questions that we have to wrestle with, is how will your experience as an outsider shape how you live as an insider? Because all of us were outsiders. All of us were excluded. All of us were unworthy. But now we've been adopted as a son. So again, how will your experience as an outsider shape how you live as an insider? Will you brag? Will you boast? Will you look down on others? Will you compare? Will you say, well, I'm an insider. You're an outsider. Or I'm a really good insider. I memorized the Bible. You don't look like you've memorized much of the Bible. I don't know if you read the Bible very often, but I do. And I pray. And I pray for you. I pray that God will rebuke you. That God will correct you. That God will help you be more like me. How will your experience as an outsider shape your experience as an insider? Shape how you act as an insider? Will it make you humble? Will you become a person who looks down on those who are on the outside? Or will you become a person who says, I was outside. I was lost. I was desperate. I was excluded. These people are excluded. And by the grace of God, I want to do anything that I can to bring them in. I want to remove barriers. I want to remove obstacles. I want to love them well. If I see somebody walking in this church who I don't know, I know that there's a danger that I'm going to freak them out, you know, by, by talking to them and, and overwhelming them. But I got to know. I got to know if they're on the inside or the outside. I got I to know why they came to them. If they are looking for a God, if they are looking for a community, if they want to join with us here, not making any presumption about where somebody stands spiritually, depending on whether they came to church last week or not, but loving them, trying to remove barriers, trying to welcome other people in. How will the fact that you are an outsider shape how you live as an insider? More on that in a minute. But first of all, let's look at how all of this happened. Verse 13 again. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away, have been brought near through the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law and its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace. And in this one body, to reconcile both of them, insiders and outsiders, to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who are far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. He says there was a wall, there was a barrier, both between God and us as well as between each other. There was a wall, there was a barrier, and that barrier needed to be destroyed. Following the end of World War II, we figured out that the Allies weren't really all that allied. Now some of them were. The, the Western powers, the United States, France, Britain, they were all kind of on one page contending as one man. Alright, but there was this other country, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, and they were on a different page. They had different values, they had different priorities, they had a different vision of what the world could become. Of what a just world would be, of what a, of what a fair world would be, of, of what a right world would be. And they were committed to their convictions. They were committed to their agenda. It was different than the Western agenda. And so as soon as one war was done, another war began, the Cold War. And it wasn't a war that, that, was, that was fought the same way that World War I and World War II had been fought. But it was this war that didn't play out as much directly between the U.S. and the USSR, but it played out all around the world in other conflicts in the Korean War, in Vietnam, the Bay of Pigs invasion, in Afghanistan, all sorts of places where we were fighting out these different worldviews. But one of the places where it was most clearly played out was in Germany. Germany had been this nation that had started both of the previous wars. All right? They were the aggressor, but now they were humble, they were humiliated. Not only were there invading armies that were occupying their land, but they actually tore the country in two. 
the, the invaders and the conquerors, they couldn't decide on how they want to manage it. You know what? We're just going to split it up. You manage your part, we'll manage our part. And what we're going to do, because we want, we want to claim our new territory, we're going to take this one nation and we're going to rip it in two. All right, we're going to make two separate countries out of it, and we're going to build a big wall between the two. The capital city of Berlin, it was actually set within East Germany. So they built a wall all the way around the western half of Berlin, called the Berlin Wall. All right? And they put guards there. They, they put a strip on each side of it known as the Death Strip. Because if you go out there, if you come into our space, it looks like you're going to climb over the wall, we're going to shoot you. Because we want, we want to make sure that this country made separate. Just like what we have today between North and South Korea. Really fought over a lot of the same things, you know, whose who's, uh, political ideology we follow. Now, when you think about that, just step back for a second. This is ridiculous. This is silly. This is bizarre. That this would be two separate countries, whether in Germany or in Korea, because these are the same people. The same history, the same heritage, the same ethnicity. They have everything in common. Except their political perspective. And that political perspective often imposed by outsiders. There is a barrier. There was a barrier in Germany, there is a barrier in Korea that stands between them and that keeps these guys divided, although they have every reason to come together. Now in Germany there were a lot of people who wanted to come back together, they wanted to be one nation, particularly in the West. They would still refer to it as one nation and give these little caveats together ruled by somebody else, they're this separate state thing, they don't really like it, we want to be back together. But in the East, they started rewriting history books. They started rewriting their heritage. They took, they took out the heroes of German culture that were on the wrong side of the tracks and they emphasized the ones who had who were more like-minded or who were from this geographic area. All right, so they stood apart as two nations as enemies until the fall of 1989. And at that point, Eastern Europe has something akin to the, the Arab Spring that we had, that we had recently in, in uh, other parts of the world. All right, and there were these protests and demonstrations, peaceful resistance, all these things saying, you know what, we don't want to do things the way that we've been doing things. And under immense pressure, the day finally came, I think it was November 9th of, um, of 1989, when the East German government said, you know what, we are going to let our people visit. We'll, we'll let you visit West Germany. We'll let you visit. Pretty soon, people were climbing over the walls, people were jumping over the walls, there were people pulling other people over the walls, and they started breaking down the walls. And by this time, this is several days after, where the euphoria has died down, but they're starting to break down the walls, they're all gathering, and people are flooding across the border. Within less than a year, Germany was one unified nation. On paper and in every way, they were one nation, they were no longer two, two nations. But before that could happen, the barrier had to be destroyed. Once we got the barrier out of the way, once we got the wall out of the way, they came together in a hurry. But first, the barrier had to be destroyed. What we see in our culture, what we see in our world, what we see in the church, what we see in the Bible, is that humanity has a tendency to define. But what we see in this text is that if we could remove the barrier, then we would naturally unite. So what is the barrier? What is our barrier? How do we destroy it? What is the barrier that we see in the text? Look at verse 13 again. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away, have been brought near, both God and to each other, through the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace. And in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. So Jesus destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. All right, so what is the barrier? If you abolish the law, is the law the barrier? Is the problem that we have rules? Is the problem that God gave these Ten Commandments and they have been divisive? And if we could get rid of this don't murder, don't lie, don't cheat on your wife thing, we would be all fine again. Is the point to abolish and destroy and remove the barrier of the law? It kind of looks that way, but if you look at other things that Jesus said, you figure out that that can't be it. To Matthew 5, Jesus says this. He says, do not think 
that I have come to abolish the law, similar language, or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law, until everything is accomplished. So if Jesus isn't literally abolishing the law, if he isn't literally destroying the law, what is it that he's destroying? What is it that he's abolishing? What is it that he is breaking down? What is the barrier? What Jesus destroyed was this false idea that the law could be a way of salvation. What, what Jesus destroyed was the law as a source of pride. This idea that I could do better than you, that I could earn my way back to God. And that's why Jesus said in the other passage that he came to fulfill the law. Because for thousands of years, and it continues on right up to today, most people in the world approach God saying, if I can do better, if I can try harder, if I can keep the rules, if I can perform well, I can earn my way back to God. I can please him, I can earn his respect, I can earn his salvation, I can earn my spot on the team. And, and in the meantime, I can boost my own self-esteem, because if I perform really well, odds are the people sitting next to me, my spouse, whatever, they won't perform equally well. And then I know that I'm, that I'm not just a good person, I'm, I'm a very good person, and more importantly, I'm a better person than you. Alright, that's what religion does for us, that's what it offers us. What Jesus means when he says, I came to abolish, I didn't come to abolish the law, I came to fulfill it, and yet at the same time, on the cross, the law was abolished. What it means is that, that Jesus showed us what we were supposed to be able to get from the Old Testament, but, but it didn't connect. We didn't connect the dots. We cannot connect the dots in our hearts now. That I can't fulfill the law, that I am not good enough. But that Jesus lived the life I was supposed to live. He died the death that I deserved to die, so that I could be reconciled to God through faith. So that my account and his account could come together through faith. That's what he offers us at the cross, and what that does for us, not only does it clear the way to God, but it says, you know what? You don't have any real reason to be proud of anymore. You don't have any reason to look down on your neighbor. You're not better than your neighbor. You're not worse than your neighbor. I'm not a better person deserving more of God's favor than you do. Nor am I more deserving of God's wrath than you are. We're all in this together. We're all messed up. There's nuances about how your depravity works out differently than my depravity. But we bring nothing to the table. So he says, what we get through the gospel is that we stop comparing ourselves to each other. And we stop trying to perform, and we fall our feet in humility before the cross, and we thank Jesus for what he has offered us, and we reconcile to one another. He says, we were all spiritual outsiders, no matter what your heritage is, and now we have the opportunity to be spiritual insiders. Now we don't have anything to fight about anymore. Because it's the same message for both of us. He came and preached peace to you who are far away, and peace to those who are near. For we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Yes, we're unique. Yes, we're individuals. Yes, we're all different. God made us that way. He made us with amazing creativity. And He wants us to express that. But from a spiritual point of view, we all stand in the same way. We all are equal in our lack of merit. We all bring nothing to the table, nothing to offer God. All that we really bring to the table is our pride. And what God says is, I want you to come to the cross, and I want to break your pride. I want you to heal. I want you to confess your sin, I want you to turn from your sin, I want you to repent. I want you to come to me as your only means of salvation. And here's what I'm going to do at that point. I am going to take a wrecking ball to your life that is built on pride and I'm going to destroy it. I'm going to take this barrier, I'm going to take this wall that you've put up through your pride that separates you from God, that separates you from each other. I'm going to take a wrecking ball to it. I'm going to reduce it to a pile of rubble. And it's going to take years. It is continuing to take years in my life. But what I'm going to continue to do is I'm going to destroy this wall. I'm going to destroy this barrier through the gospel. And you're going to see this pile of rubble all, all the way around, these bricks, these, these pieces of concrete. And then I'm going to start a building project. I'm going to build this together into something new. It's part of the reason that we have the name Mosaic for the church. Taking something broken and making it beautiful together, okay? The way he describes it in this passage is as a building project. 
that he's going to take these bricks that we are, and he's going to build a new guy. Where do we go with this pile of rubble? Verse 19. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens. You're no longer outsiders. But fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, you're part of the family, built on the foundation, again, a building project, of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building, that's us, is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. He says, the demolition of our pride, humbled by the gospel, allows us to be built together. To become one, not just with each other, and not just with God, but to become one with those who are outside the circle that he wants to bring in. That it gives us the humility that we don't look down on anybody else, but we welcome everybody else as brothers, and we say, come on in, join with us. We have very little to offer of ourselves, but we have a God to offer, and we want you to experience Him. Come in. The barrier is removed. The barrier has been removed. And Paul is painting this picture of this 2,000-year-old building project, where Christ Jesus is the absolute foundation. He is the cornerstone. He is, he is the really big rock in the corner that everything else is either laid on top of or built against. And he says there's, there's also other foundation stones, the apostles and the prophets, his early followers, the guys who wrote the New Testament. Their teaching, that's going to be the foundation that we're going to build on. And then century after century, generation after generation, for the last 2,000 years, he's been laying bricks on top of it. He's been laying rubble on top of it. He's been laying broken stones on top of it. And he's building that up. And he says, here's our opportunity in this generation, in this city, in this church, to continue to build on that church. The, the reason that we use this symbol today is because you have this majestic, amazing cathedral. That is just layer upon layer upon layer of God taking bricks and building them together. And the metaphor in this passage is that you are the brick. You are the brick in this story. In him the whole building, that's us, is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the world. And in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by the Spirit. So the question is, what kind of brick are you? What kind of brick are you? I know it's a, it's a very complimentary metaphor that you're a brick. What kind of brick are you? Maybe a way, another way to get at that is, is what are the desires of your heart? What do you daydream about? What are your ambitions? What do you want in life? Do you dream about getting married or finding a job or building a house or, not, or buying a house or not we've got a house or renovating a house or you know, moving up to the career or retiring? What are your fantasies? What are your dreams? What do you, what do you long to be a part of? Are your dreams individual or are your dreams corporate? Are your dreams all about you and your own pursuits or are your dreams about God? When you think about the building that you are building with your life, is it your own individual structure that just like the power of Babel is being built for your glory? So that I can make a name for myself. So that I can have a great resume, so that I can enjoy life, so that I will be remembered by others? Are you building a monument to yourself? Or are you becoming one more humble brick in the larger building project that God is trying to build together? That will be a temple in which he lives by his Holy Spirit. As Americans, we are incredibly individualistic, maybe more than any other culture in the world. We love to think about ourselves. Everything is individual. The Bible is not written that way. The Bible is not an individual book. We come to God as individuals in salvation. You, God has no grandkids. You don't get in on the coattails of your daddy's faith, your mommy's faith, your grandma's faith. All right? But the picture that he paints as we come to him is that we come together. And we become a brick in the temple, and we are built together, and we join together, and we become something beautiful together. We become a monument, not to ourselves, but a monument to our God. When you think about the Christian life, do you think about it individually? When you think about growing in the Christian life, do you think about it as my own personal spiritual disciplines? Which, by the way, are great. Um, probably every other week we have a little insert in the bulletin that's a Bible reading. It's something you can do individually. 
We want you to pray individually. We want you to pursue God individually, not just when we gather together. But what we see in the Bible is that the Christian life is a team sport. So when we think about growth in Christ, if it's all about how can I grow, how can I become more disciplined, less sinful, whatever, we're kind of missing the point. Because the question is, how do we grow together? How do we build together? How do we become something beautiful together? How do we assemble as a community? So when I think about how am I going to grow, part of what I have to wrestle with is how am I going to help you grow? How are you going to help me grow? How are we going to get close enough, vulnerable enough, open enough about our sin, about our failings, about everything? How are we going to share enough meals together that we know each other well enough that we can help each other be built together? They become a temple in which the Holy Spirit lives. Alright? The Holy Spirit lives in every believer individually. But there is a greater sense in which He wants to live in us corporately. He wants to speak to me through you. He wants to speak to you through me. He wants us to work together and join together and become a dwelling in which God lives by His Spirit together. I don't know the exact particulars of how God wants to work that out individually in your life. I don't have a, a magic eight ball that's revealing this to me. But what I do know from Scripture is that God wants us to work this out together. When we're making huge decisions in our life, about career, about, about next steps, about anything, He wants us to be surrounded by people who love us and who know the Scripture and who can speak into our lives so that we can do this together. He wants us to partner together. He wants us to he wants us to have that, that semper fi, that always faithful thing that the Marines have. We're not leaving anybody behind. We're sticking together. We are going at this together. It is a corporate battle, something we do together. When God looked down at the Tower of Babel, he saw rebellion, but he also saw potential. The verse I read to you earlier, he said, If as one people, speaking the same language, they have begun this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. He looked at humanity, sinful humanity, not even involved by the Holy Spirit, and said, you guys could do anything if you stand together. And that is the exact vision that he has for his church, that humanity would be an absolutely unstoppable force, not in rebellion to God, but in submission to God for his glory. That's what he did design the church to be, to be his image bearers. <clears throat> to be his hands and feet, to be his voice, to be his body, to be his team out on mission, together in the world. Philippians 1.27, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, here's what it's going to look like to live life worthy of the gospel. I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel. God's design is that we would contend as one man. Not for our glory, not for our dreams, not for our priorities, not for anything that's uniquely about us, but to make His name great in the world. That we would knit together, that we would love each other, that we would invest in each other. Because pursuing Christ well takes courage. It takes a huge amount of encouragement. It courage, it takes a huge amount of discipline, and that requires encouragement. We need each other to do this work. If you're wrestling with what that looks like, if you want to be in on that, one opportunity we have coming up tonight, we're going to gather, um, gather for a meeting for new members. Some of you went through this process a few months ago. Um, some of you haven't yet. We'd love you to come out. Let us know so we have enough pizza for you. Uh, we're going to have that meeting at the office. You can get the information from me from a lot of people who know where the office is. Five o'clock tonight, we'll gather for a couple hours, child care provided. And we'll talk about what it looks like to build together as one man. To be a force together, changing the world together. All right? If you're new to the church, if you're just trying to figure out who Jesus is, this is one of our deeper series. Getting, in, getting into some things that apply very specifically to Christians. But one of the things that I would ask you to understand from this is that if you feel like an outsider, one of the clear things in this text is that it is our calling to welcome you into a relationship with the living God, to welcome you to be an insider. And that's our, that's our, that's our passion. Let's pray. God, it is an amazing thing that you have taken us from being so distant, so far off, so excluded, so hopeless, and you have knit us together. 
Lord, it's an amazing thing that even though we are the barrier, that our self-centered pride, that our egos are the barrier between each other and, and keeping us from you, that you took initiative to destroy that barrier. God, I pray for those of us who know you, that you would give us hearts that would yield to you more and more every day and invite you to continue to destroy the barrier that is in our heart, that would keep us from you, that would keep us from each other, that would keep us independent and self-centered and unfruitful. Lord, would you get us together for your glory? God, for those who are still trying to figure out who you are, would you, would you move in their hearts to draw them to you, to give them the courage, to ask questions, to come back, to take next steps? And Lord, would you help us to be effective, not just to be unified in relationships, but to be unified on mission, Lord, that we might draw others to you, that we might be the kind of unstoppable force that you can't picture of in your work. Amen.